Auto Web. Welcome to the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast, Auto the Web. number one resource for automotive sales professionals, managers, and owners Auto Web. to learn how to make money, accumulate wealth, and to all out ball out in the auto industry. And now, your hosts, Sean V. Bradley and L.A. Williams. One, two, three, four, five. Auto Web. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is L.A. Williams, and I am here on the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast. Sean is um, taking the day off. I don't know what he's doing, but uh, man, I'm just, I'm excited to have a conversation today. I've brought some daggum superstars. Uh, some of you know that we just completed the Internet Sales 20 group, and we had some speakers that were, you know, up there, and some of them were really impressive. And this gentleman uh, that I'm bringing, he and his partner, man, they were really impressive. I love what they brought to the table. And I said, Said, man, I gotta, I gotta get the story even more out there because a bunch of folks I know, because I know it was because of COVID. I know that's the only reason why you weren't there. Give you an excuse, right? Um, but I know that that's the reason why, and so I don't want you to miss out on the information. I know you might have saw clips in the Millionaire Car Salesman Facebook group, but man, it's nothing like actually spending time with people. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna bring to the microphone the one and only Mr. Nate Dog. Now, get what's going on, Nate? What's up, buddy? How are you, man? Good to see you again. Oh, absolutely, man. I'm really excited about having this conversation with you, man. So it was was the Internet Sales 20 Group, was that fun or what? Oh, we had a blast. We made so many good connections, met some new people, uh, left there just super fired up and, and you know, taking some new ideas to the market. We're super, super stoked. Yeah, man, that joint was great. Now, did you get a chance to uh, connect at the VIP party? Uh, we did. We hosted it. We hosted yeah. the, uh, the uh, party. Uh, well, not so, the VIP party. No, we hosted Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, we, we did. We, uh, the cocktail we, we hour, right? The MMA guys, yeah, that was cool. That was yeah, cool. that was kind of fun. <laughs> there was a whole lot of stuff going on, yeah. But uh, Karen and I performed at the uh, at the internet, at the uh, VIP party, so that was kind of fun and all kind of cool stuff. So, yeah, man. So, listen, I, I brought you here for a reason, right? You guys are extremely successful. You've been, you know, killing the game, doing your thing. But I know that. Um, you know, automotive industry is usually not on people's top of the list. Like, you know, you grow up second and third grade. It's like, oh, I'm going to be a car salesman. right? <laughs> so, right, right. so how did you even get involved? What were you doing before you got uh, connected with automotive? So I was uh, I was in the military, man. I was uh, I was a survival instructor in the Air Force or it was actually called SEER. Uh, mm -hmm. for survival, evasion, resistance and escape. We taught pilots how to live off the land if they ever got shot down. In, wow. in a combat environment. I did that till I was 35. And then uh, I worked as a contractor and in the military. And then at about 35, my body started breaking down, man. I couldn't do it anymore. I was, uh, I was, my, my knees were bad. My back was bad and I was getting old. Mm. And so, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> you know, like, like thousands of other veterans, I, 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 I needed to still make the money I was making. And mm -hmm. so I, I got into the car business. I had, you know, some family members have been in the car business in the past. And, and uh, so I knew, I knew a bit about it and I knew it was a good way to make money. And, and um, you know, from, from my, from my job as an instructor, I had good people skills and I could communicate and, and read people well and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and I, I knew that, that, that it would, it would uh, carry over well into the auto, auto industry. Well, man, thank you so much for your service. So you got in, you started selling cars and all of that good stuff. Now, when you were selling cars, how um, like how many cars did you sell on a right on an average? Well, I got in, I, I got pretty lucky. I started off in internet sales. Um, I okay. was an internet sales manager. I was, I was brought in not necessarily as a you know taking ups on the floor and working working that those type of leads. So mm -hmm. I started off. I started uh, 20, 25 cars a month for the first six months, and then was quickly uh, moved into, into, into the finance office. But yeah, man, it, wow. was, it, was, it was good. It was that's a, a crazy. Honda, Honda store. <laughs> nice. Yo, that's, that's it. Now, so where was this located? The only reason why I'm asking is because you got some people who will make the excuse like, oh, he's in this store, he's in that store, he's, you know, everything's given to him. Where, where were you located? Spokane, Washington. <laughs> see and so listen if you're in a because listen the average car salesman you guys already know sell 9.6 units a month right so if you're not selling 10 15 cars a month you're not even you know it, it's, it's you're not hitting it right so you at 2025 20, man that's really good stuff you're you're already more than double what the average person was doing so that's pretty cool so now what did that do for you financially i heard you loud and clear 
when you said, hey, listen, I need something that's going to put food on the table, put money in my pocket the yeah. same way that I was making money in the, um, you know, in the military as an instructor and all of that good stuff. So what did that do? Did it, did it meet your expectations? Did it exceed it? Break it down to us. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I had three kids and child support and, and all that kind of fun stuff. So, I mean, I had to make the money. I was, you know, I, I had to hustle and I, and I put in the extra hours and, you know, I, I worked from home and and I never took a day off. I mean, even if I had a day off, I had my cell phone and, you know, you're answering emails and, and you're, you know, you're working clients and I rarely would split a deal. I would go in on my day off. I lived super close to work and, and you know, just made it work. Um, being in the internet sales, it wasn't like, you know, we were we were super aggressive on pricing. So it wasn't like we were holding big giant gross on all these deals. So you had to sell 20, 25 to make seven, eight, nine, 10 grand a month. It wasn't, you know, that was 11, 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, you know, I was, I was making a lot of minis to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, we would hold gross when we could, but on the internet side, you know, we were just super aggressive and, and, you know, just moving a lot of product to be honest. Yeah, no, money is money, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, whatever it takes, like, don't don't pretend even with, you know, our people who sell, you know, 50, 60 units a month. Don't we're not going to pretend as if, you know, everybody's not a T got your keys and gross, you know, I mean, crazy. Right. Minis are going to be a part of it. So I definitely get that. So I heard you, man, you were kind of kicking. You were dropping some nuggets as you were saying this stuff. You were like, you know, oh, man, I worked from home. I did this. I did that. So you're going to have to flesh some of that out. Right. What are some of the keys to success and making money in the automotive industry to kind of flesh that out when you talk about working from home people stuff you know stuff people don't want to do i mean especially on the internet sales right it's the first person that gets that lead uh i was fortunate that i i I wasn't sharing leads i was the main guy and so if if a lead came in at 11 or 12 o'clock at night and uh (laughs) i would answer it you know and i i would literally be messaging a person if they're if they're out looking at cars at midnight on the internet i was answering their calls and answering their messages and and uh, I'd go in the next morning at eight o'clock and have a cardio, you know, wow. versus versus going in at eight o'clock in the morning and, and seeing all the leads and then answering them from there. So I, I did to them before anybody else did. And, mm-hmm. you know, just start to just start to develop that relationship. And and uh, even back then, I did a lot of stuff with video. I thought I thought that that was super helpful, even though it was you know low grade video on my cell phone. But right. You know, 11, 12 years ago. But uh, you know, just, just, just to shoot them a video real quick and, you know, hey, walking into work right now, I just wanted to show you, here's the car, you, you know, even before I do open the doors at the office. Wow. So you were progressive. I mean, because I don't care what kind of great video it is. It's better than a daggum static text message, right? <laughs> so yeah, <for> sure. <laughs> I'm definitely with you on that. So it sounds like, you know, that progressive thought process is part of what got you into management. You want to talk a little bit about what made them choose you to, hey, listen, we're looking for a finance person. Because like, think about it, there's a lot of salespeople out there who want to get promoted. Um, how do they do yeah. that? What, what, what do they need to uh, I mean, I, th- I think you have, to sh- you have to show the aggressive uh, aggressiveness to, you know, want to advance. Um, mm-hmm. I wasn't, I was you know, I was never happy with where I was at. I always wanted to be moving up the chain and, and. I would ask a lot of questions. I would, you know, I would sit in with the finance managers and ask them questions. And, and I, I just wanted to know everything about all the different aspects of the business. Uh, I didn't nice. know what direction I was going to go in. I mean, I went, you know, I went to the auctions with the GM once in a while on my day off just to kind of see that side of things. And I just wanted to, you know, really immerse myself in all aspects to, to learn all the different parts. I thought it was kind of interesting. I didn't know anything about it. And, uh, you know, just by showing that initiative, I think that moved me up the moved me up the chain a little bit quicker, maybe. Yeah, I totally wish. I mean, that's exactly what I did. It was it's crazy how our stories really collide in that sense because. For me, you know, even when I started first started working with Sean, he had me as an analyst, right? I was all angry, right? And so in order for me to get promoted into a trainer, I would take my days off and go to dealerships. I would sneak, right, to the dealerships with the other trainers and everything. So, yeah, man, I think it's a, it's a common thing where, hey, if you put in the time, if you put in the effort, if you show the curiosity – You'll kind of get which, where you got to get to. All right, cool. So then you get promoted. They, you're, you're a finance manager. Tell me about your time as a finance manager. Uh, you know, what was good? What had you learned? Were you nailing it as a finance manager or did you face some challenges? Break that down to us. It was like drinking water from a fire hose, man. Um, <laughs> you know, I had no idea what I was like doing. with Sean Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I got into finance, bro. I, I wasn't I didn't have a finance background. I, I, you know, I didn't have a college degree. 
I never, you know, I wasn't in banking. I didn't know how to read a credit report, to be honest with you. I just kind of faked it. You know, I fake, wow. fake it till you make it, right? Isn't that what they say? So, I mean, that's mm-hmm. what I did. And um, I, 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 I did as much research as I could and, you know, go on YouTube. And, I mean, you can go on YouTube and learn how to read a credit report. So, that way you don't mm-hmm. look stupid when you go to your GM or somebody else asking questions that you might think you should know. You know, just go find that information. There's plenty of it out there. But, uh, you know, I just kind of... It, it was a sales job, man. It, it's not a, it, you know, it's not a numbers game. I got calculators that can do numbers and I got computers that can do the numbers. It, it's a sales right. job. You're still, you're, you're still, you know, building rapport and building a relationship and building trust. It's just a different ball game. You know, when you're selling a car or you're on internet or whatever, you might talk to a customer for, for two weeks or two months mm-hmm. you know, before they, before they buy a car from you. And I, you know, I build a lot of relationships over that time frame, and, you know, you get into finance you got five minutes to build that relationship, but you still got to do it. <laughs> you know, you got to, yeah. I always said I, I was a good chameleon. You know, I could, uh, I could find something in common with just about anybody with my background. And it, even if I didn't, I could fake it and, and mm-hmm. you know, act like I had something in common with them. Cause I think people like to work with people they like, yeah, you know, so, absolutely. so I try to build, you know, I, I try to build that relationship and just kind of walk them through the process. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, Obviously, in finance, you're always taught, you know, work your pay plan. But yeah. to the same extent, you, you've got to keep the customer, you know, their 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 needs in mind. And, you know, I think customers know if you're out to help them, if you're out to help yourself. And I, I think as long as you, you know, you're, you're transparent and you, you know, guide them down that path and, and don't force them into a direction that just doesn't make sense only because it benefits you. Then I, then I think you, you can be very, very successful uh, moving from s- sales with no background into finance. That's nice, man. It's so interesting that you're saying what you're saying, because I just finished a rapport building class earlier this morning. And we talked about two of the things that you mentioned, relatability being one, right? You got to be able to relate to the customer and then also transparency. I say, listen, if you're going to be successful in the decade of 2020, you better be authentic, right? Authenticity right. is the key. If, if it's not that, man, you're going to be in a whole lot of trouble. So pretty cool. All right. So now you're in finance, right? You're faking some stuff. You kind of having some success. What are some of the challenges that you're faced with though? Like I know you got computers that can do the number stuff, but what are, what are you running into? Yeah. The biggest thing for me was just learning the lenders, man. Just, um, there, there's so many, you know, with the area I was in, in the Northwest, we had probably 60 or 70 different credit unions and 15 or 20 different banks. And then, you know, we have our captive and you got leasing. And that was the hard part for me was I could sell and I could do all that, but my paperwork was terrible. It took me forever to get a deal bought and submitted and funded and that's the part of my job I hated. I love the yeah. I love the interaction and the back and forth. And you know, you got that customer that sits down and before you even start, they say, I'm not buying anything. I never buy any, I'm not gonna buy a warranty. Don't even try, right? Mm-hmm. And then you turn that guy into a okay, well, I guess it makes sense for the first time and I'll do it this time. You know, those are those are the wins, man. That was what's fun. That's what gets you fired up. Yeah. And then you gotta you gotta talk to a banker and get a deal bought and funded and and contracts and transit and steps and all that. That was the worst part of the job. That's, that's the part that I, that I hated. And that I, you know, I always struggled with just even knowing where to go with the, with the deal. Right. I mean, if I got yeah. a deal bought and I've got the room and I, you know, I, I know I can sell whatever I was in, I was in my element then, man. But when I didn't know, and I, and you know, you're, you're worried if I sell something for too much and then you got to bring the customer back in and resell oh it. Or you don't even know where to write it at. You know, it's a, Saturday night at nine o'clock and no banks are open and you're just guessing that that's where, <laughs> that's where I struggle, man. And I always felt like I was leaving money on the table because maybe you're not as aggressive as you, as you should be because you're really just, just trying to make sure that that paper gets hung and that you got a cashable contract when they leave your office versus being aggressive and, and, you know, shooting for the moon. Yeah. The worst I thing as a finance manager is when they say yes at the first pass, Right. And, and, and you could have asked for more, but you didn't because right. you just wanted to get it done. And then you always feel like you're leaving money on the table. You might sell them five or six products and, and make, make a good deal. But, you know, if they say yes the first time around, you didn't ask for enough. Hmm. Negotiation 201. <laughs> we totally know that. So, man, so what's crazy is, you know, I think what I like about you, man, is that the, the kind of person you are, you're like, man, if I'm having these challenges, there's probably other 
you know, finance people, other people in the automotive industry just having these same problems. Like, cause right. obviously you're not by yourself. You're a sharp guy. Right. So, so break down what, what did you do to kind of address that? Oh man. I, uh, so I, I reached out to all my reps and tried to build relationships with as many lenders as I could, you know, so that I, 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 I had no problem getting on the phone and calling a, 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 a bank rep at 10 o'clock at night. Cause you know, he's getting paid on those deals too, just like I am. And that's his job just as much as mine. I didn't mm-hmm. care if it was a Saturday or a Sunday. And, you know, I, I, I did build some relationships and, and so that helped. Um, but I still always kind of felt like, you know, outside of my five or six buddies that were, that were my buyers, you know, if I had a deal that they wouldn't buy or I couldn't get a hold of them or it was outside of their parameters, that's where I always struggled. You know, whenever I got, I got into those type of situations, um, mm-hmm. you know, I tried to keep a bank book and all that kind of stuff that everybody, every other finance manager done, you know, you got a three ring binder in the back of the office with a bunch of rate sheets and I'd flip through them and try to figure out which ones made sense. And, but the problem is they all, you know, they, they all get updated at different times. It's not like on the first of every month, everybody updates their rates. You know, it, I've, got, I've got lenders who update their rates once a year, once a month, once a week. You just never know. And so that, was, crazy. Always, that was always difficult too, you know, is, is knowing that you had accurate information. So, man, I, I tried everything. I, I tried the three ring binder. I tried building relationships. I tried building Excel spreadsheets and, and you know, kind of giving myself like a little a quick glance, like who will use NADA or versus Kelly blue book and who will do 84 months and you know, what kind of advances and all that, but you got 80 lenders you're trying to keep track of. It's, it's just impossible. So yeah, um, I, I looked for a program that would do that for me. I, you know, as I moved up through my career, I, I became a director for auto nation and I had finance managers that were working for me or with me and, and moved into a big market in Seattle where we did, you know, we did 400, 450 units a month. And, and we're talking three grand a, a rack on the back end. You know, we're talking big, big money, you know, and I'm, I'm directing that. Support, you know, and I've got seven or eight finance managers and I'm responsible for, bro, we would roll everything. It didn't matter. If the customer would say yes, we would send them down the road. Right. And then, and then we'd go, we'd go try, go get it bought. You know, and if you don't get it bought, bring them back in and sign them at a higher rate or whatever. And, and I t- you want to talk about crazy, man. That was a, it was a headache and it was, and it was, uh, a lot of pressure. So I looked for, Can imagine. I looked for something out there that would help me to be able to look at all my lenders that, you know, in a snapshot. And, uh, I looked at, I, I couldn't find it and I couldn't find anything that would do that. And it was frustrating. And I asked people and I quickly realized that there was a niche in the market that wasn't being taken care of. Um, and so over a lot of beers and margaritas, uh, I, I convinced Brett Davis, my, my business partner now, to help me develop a program. Uh, he had zero knowledge of the auto industry, um, but luckily, after about six months of lots of tequila and lots of margaritas, I was able to uh, convince him to, to partner with me on this because I knew that there was a niche and I knew that there was something that um, could obviously helped me from a business standpoint. I, to be honest with you, I never wanted to start a, start a company. It was never uh, an idea I had. It was never a goal. Um, I'd always worked for somebody else and I was just kind of used to that grind, you know, and, and, and uh, it was, it was scary jumping in, but, but we did it. And uh, you know, I knew I could help other people who, who were in a similar situation as I was in. And for the first time in my life, I could work for myself and not work for the man. And I could be the man. And uh, there you, go. you know, and, and that's what we've been that's what we've been doing. We've we've been going strong for a little over a year now. And uh, I couldn't have done it without Brett. Nice, that's good. All right, so let's and let's get introduced to Brett. We got Brett here on the podcast as well. Brett, what's going on, man? He said he yeah, had to hey, hey. basically put you in a drunken stupor to get you to work with him, or was yeah, it something he right. actually that's said? Right. <laughs> they are they are still flowing, but no. Uh, and leading on to his sales salesmanship, I've been in the uh, technology space for about gosh 20, 25 years, and worked for some big companies like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, and and built a lot of systems and and had all this experience. And Nate you know, he kept poking me, right? Hey, I got this great idea. And of course, you know, it took a while, but his good salesmanship kind of paid off. And I realized this, this, for as many things as I get pitched on a, on a weekly, daily, monthly basis, technology wise, it, this is one of the things out of all, of all the things I've heard that said, you know what, this is worth me 
investing my time in to help Nate build because it there if there really isn't anything else out there that does what you're saying this thing can do, Nate, that this is a this is a gold mine. So um, at least you know, thankfully, fast forward two and a half years, we are where we are now, and it's uh, it, it's been taken off. So uh, yeah, man, absolutely. absolutely All right. Beat it. So the whole flow is this is e-director, right? Can you like just give us like the the simple? I mean, I heard you talk you talked about the challenges. You talked about you know, I guess basically what it does, meaning from a problem standpoint. But if somebody was like, okay, now I don't work with e director, what is it that you do specifically? Like so in, a, in a quick sentence. Yeah, we're a, uh, a digital bank book, man. We take every lender that a dealership has access to and we download all those rates and we put it into our system. And then based on the structure of your deal, the credit, the, where the customer lives, what vehicle they're buying, we show a snapshot of every single lender what their rate is, what their terms are, how many months you can go, what the front end advance is, how much room you got on the back end, how much you can sell all your products for, what your flats are, what you can mark the, what mark the deal up to. So you can literally look at 75 lenders or 100 lenders all at once, determine which ones are going to be most profitable, and then, and then submit it to those banks rather than shotgun it to a bunch of lenders that don't make any sense. Mm. That's crazy. So, so basically, is do you think that this is something that's just good for new finance managers, or can experienced folks get some value out of it too? I mean, I was in the business for eleven years, and and I use the program every day. Um, now, I, I think it's probably better for the younger guys like myself when I started out versus the eleven year vet I was at, uh, and maybe just because I was stubborn and I thought I knew it all. And I think there's mm. a lot of people out there that are the same way. I was getting ready um, to say, no way, not in automotive. Are you serious? Like, <laughs> hard to believe, right? hard to believe. Some of us, some of those guys making 25, 30 grand are still lazy. Mm, and, yeah. you know, but but I, I equate it to, you know, the menu, right? I remember when the menu came out five, six, seven years ago, whatever it was, whenever I was at my dealership and they, they brought us in this, this iPad and they're like, Hey man, you're going to, you're going to have to use this iPad now. And we want you to do interviews with the customer on the floor and, and all this. And, and I fought it, man. I, I used to do everything on a, on a legal notepad and a Sharpie, bro. I, I would write down, here's what's covered. Here's what's not. Here's what your responsibilities are. Here's, what's, here's what our responsibilities are. And if you want this stuff taken care of, this is how we can do it. This is what your payment is, blah, blah, blah. Sign here, press hard three copies. Right? And uh, There you go. And then now I got to do an interview and I got to do this and I got to ask all these questions and and you know what? I bought into it and I did it and my numbers went up and I made more money and, and the process worked. And, and our, our program is no different. You can't tell me that, that there's many people out there. There might be a few, but there's not many that can tell me every single rate and every single uh, program for you know, special deals. And, and they go through and they update and they look at the rate sheets three times a week like we do to make sure mm-hmm. that they're up to date. And they've got all, there's just no way. You you yeah. will make more money without a doubt if you use our program, and you will you will be it'll be a quicker pro it'll be a quicker process because you're not wasting time submitting to lenders that you don't have a chance getting the deal bought. You know you'll maximize every deal. You won't have resigns because you sold a gap policy for nine ninety nine when you could only do nine ninety five, and now you got to resign a customer over four dollars. You know stuff like that, man. It, yeah, just, man. You, now will will a young finance manager or a young desk manager benefit more for sure? I, no doubt about it. You know, if you've been yeah. if you've been in the business for a long time and you got an 800 credit score and you're only going 72 months, you sure as hell better know where to send that to and know how to maximize that deal without my program. If you can't and you don't, then you probably shouldn't be in the position you're at. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm definitely with you on that one, but it's just so crazy because so many people are now, you know, getting promoted. We're looking for look the the, the automotive industry. Period. We always talk about attrition, right? Meaning that um, you know, we got a seven to eighty percent attrition ratio. And what I'm saying is that you know the people who are at the dealership within one year, seven out of ten people, seventy five percent of those people will not be there anymore. So people are getting promoted in the finance. Managers are leaving. People are going to other industries. It's just all 
all kind of crazy stuff that's happening. So why not have a program basically where, you know, it helps to collapse time frames? That's what it sounds like to me that it does for a a finance manager. It helps you save time, right? So if you're, you know, one of those finance managers or if you have a finance manager that's always busy all the time, can't never meet with the customer, the line backing up out the door, right? Why is that? It's because he's spending time doing stuff that a program could do just like that, right? Uh, I was just watching an interview with Elon Musk, right? And he talked about, you know, uh, he's talking about, you know, autonomous vehicles. He said, you know, basically within uh, 20 years or so, having a a, a vehicle with a steering wheel is going to be as crazy as like having a horse. I mean, some people have horses, but it's like, you're not going to look at that as a mode of transportation. Right. And so it's the same thing here. Um, You know, Malik and I on stage, the young Jedi, we talked about how if you don't have a VBC at this point in time, what's happening with the automotive industry, you know, it's like, they still make you, are you crazy? Right. And so this is the same type of thing. I think this is a product that, you know, it it just needs to be a part. It's like having a daggone smartphone. You know what I'm saying? You can have a smartphone or a dumb phone. Which one are you going to choose? <laughs> After these messages, we'll be right back. Attention auto dealers. You need an opportunity to do business to do business. AutoWeb is one of the largest suppliers of high quality leads. I mean, high quality buyers. At a 10% closing ratio, you will be at less than $190 per car sold. Don't just settle for what you get. AutoWeb can fully customize your results through targeted markets and or zip codes. And as a partner, you will get premium placement within search results. Who better to do that than literally the people that invented automotive internet sales? If you want to sell more cars more often and more profitably, then you need AutoWeb. Yeah, another way to look at it is, you know, I've worked at a couple of different dealerships now and and they always wanted two sets of eyes on every deal, right? You just want somebody else to look at the deal real quick, make sure that you got the right trade value or you got the right term or or whatever, right? This is just a way to have another set of eyes look at it. But you don't have to pay that dude 20 grand a month or 15 grand a month as a, as a sales manager. And yeah. You, could, you know, you just run it through the program really quick. Double check. Make sure that, hey, I was thinking about sending it to XYZ Bank. Throw it in there. Make sure, hey, if XYZ Bank shows up as one of the top three or four, then you roll and you're good. But you know what? If you if you think I'm going to go to XYZ Bank and you look at XYZ Bank is like the 10th best lender, maybe, maybe now you look at A, B, and C lenders. And and you, you pick up an extra five hundred bucks in your or whatever that number is. Yeah, absolutely, man. You guys are absolutely on it. Y'all rocking and rolling. So, man, listen again. I, I feel like we got some sharp folks on here. Um, I generally ask, like, how in the world did you get to be as successful as you are? Because again, like I said, you don't. You know, you come out of the military, you kind of, you know, you get on the floor, you start selling cars, you're doing what you're doing. Uh, but after that, it's like, hey, where do you get the the training? Like, how do you get as good as you are? Would you say um, for you, Nate, let's let's start with you, Nate, and then I'll kind of go to Brett. Sure. I mean, I, uh, you know, I feel like I, I, I was lucky and fortunate that I started off with a couple of um, I started off in the Larry Miller group. And so they had uh, a lot of really good training processes in place. They had some amazing trainers uh, that would come to our dealership and work with us. And um, I always like to say that, you know, I I feel like my process by the time I got it down was was about as good as it could be. But none of it was unique to me. Right. I would take and watch other people's uh, pitches and, and, and their spiel. Right. And I would pick little pieces from it. Maybe it was like a little one liner that somebody said that I thought was funny. And I would take that and I would incorporate that into my presentation. And I would use somebody, you know, I I probably had 10 or 15 different people that I had either watched videos of or sat down and watched them do it or asked them to do their presentation. And I would pick little pieces of what I liked and I would put that into my my part and and make it my own. Don't get me wrong, but nothing that I did was unique. Uh, I didn't try to reinvent the wheel. I just tried to make a better wheel. Yeah. That's right. So implementing, you know, emulating what you've seen great people do. I love that. That's what I'm talking about. Brett, how about how, how about for you, man? You said you work with some of the biggest companies. I mean, you guys are successful. There. What would you say is the the key aspect of your success? Honestly, in a single word, I'd say a mentor or two words. Mm. But, uh, mentors and connections. So all through the years, it's a you know I find people that uh, kind of like Nate said to emulate, and you know I see you guys are you already have what I want. <laughs> what I'm striving for, how do I, you know, 
pick your brain to get as much info as I can from you to, to be that person. So between having great mentors all of my life and also uh, a lot of connections, those connections, you know, inevitably uh, sounds so simple, right? But, you know, have friends that are like-minded friends, great connections, and great mentors that can lead you along the way. And that's uh, definitely helped me get to where I am today. So. Got it. So with like the whole drinking thing, was that like a mentor thing? Like, oh, man. <laughs> well, and that's where all the connections come from, right? Oh, so, yeah. so I can't tell you how many connections I've made simply for meeting up at, uh, you know, talking about tequila or the best mezcals to drink. And that Absolutely. And conversation and <laughs> that's pretty cool but yeah man you gotta have something in common right <laughs> yeah that's right. i love it i'll pitch I it up on you i i uh when i got into you know i went from always working for somebody else right or, or being in the military and i was you know when at my position in the military we were taught leadership skills and a lot of that kind of stuff so i mean obviously i think that's super helpful and and i would say to anybody out there if you're you know if you're looking at hiring somebody if they've got a military background, I would take that over a four-year college any day of the week. Um, and, and a book that I started reading, it's it's called Extreme Ownership. Um, it's basically written by some Navy SEALs, and it's about how um, they have taken their, their leadership that they learned in the military, and they implemented it in the real world. And it's just a, it's a really, really good book. Um, I, you know, and, and Brett will be the first to admit that, you know, I'm not maybe the easiest person to work with all the time because of my military background. And, and sometimes I just, um, you know, I'm of the mentality that, that you don't ask questions, you just get something done. And, you know, but coming from the background I'm at, sometimes if, if you ask too many questions, and you don't do what you're told, people can lose their lives. You know, it's a little bit different than what you deal with every day in the real world. So, so that's definitely a hard transition. Uh, for, for people who are coming from the military where they've got that, you know, a little bit more straightforward and, and do as I say, and, and there's a reason. And, and you know, so I've, I've had I've had to, you know, learn a lot from how to how to use those skills that I had, because uh, I think they're excellent skills. And, and I learned a lot when I, in my time in the military. But to be able to work with civilians, you know, in, in, a, in a real world situation. And, and uh, Extreme Ownership, it, it's written by uh, Jocko Will, Willenick, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I can't recommend it enough. It, it's a super good book. It's a really, it's a good read. Um, it, 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 it talks about like, you know, military situations that these guys were in and what lessons they learned and then how they apply that to a, uh, a corporate world. So uh, definitely, a, definitely a, a good, uh, you know, especially for other vets, it's a, it's a good, it's a fun read because you kind of, you know, realize how to, to use, you know, what you've dedicated your whole life to and still, you know, feel like you can, you can, you know, function in, in the, the new society that you're in. Absolutely. Sean Matson talked about that book on our Against All Odds radio show. He's a Navy SEAL. Um, and man, I think he was a part of Team SEAL, uh, Team SEAL. I think it was six or eight or something like that. But either way, he, he, yeah, he totally recommends that book. So, all right. So, Brett, I need from you, man, two, three things that your mentors taught you that like really just kind of, oh my gosh, that's that everybody got to hear this. What would you say? Gosh, that's a, that, that's a tough one. I feel like it's one of those things over the years you, you, you pick up so much, right? And it's, but it's the, one of the biggest things I can say without a doubt is the don't, basically don't give up. Seriously, it's that go get an attitude and expect to fail sometimes nine times before the 10th time. So every one of those failures is just, is, is that much closer you're getting to success. So instead of getting defeated, a lot of people, you know, something doesn't go right one, two, three times. And they're like, all right, this isn't working. Time to move on. Mm. One of the best things I've learned is no, no, no. That just means you're getting that much closer to um, success being right around the corner. So uh, that's one of the biggest things I've learned and also a goal list. Uh, I mean, you're going to read that in any book you find, but that was another thing that one of my uh, favorite mentors, he was like, every single morning I wake up, wake up, I write down what is my goal for the day? And I have my long-term goals, but what is my goal just for today? And if I can get yeah. that one thing done, it's, it's a successful day. <laughs> Yeah, but see, here's the thing. I mean, we hear this stuff all the time, but it's like, when are we going to make a decision to actually do it, right? Well, and so, Brett, the cool thing... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, Um, you know, so when people hear it from you, right, They there's going to be one, two, three people that just make a decision, you know, say, you know what, man, I heard uh, Brett say that I should write down my goal. I, I really I felt, I felt 
how he said it, right? So again, we hear this stuff over and over. And over. We hear plain as day, be coachable. Being coachable is so, so important. But Nate says be coachable. Nate says just do it and ask questions later. And you know, sometimes, uh, you know, some people will get it, right? You talk about not giving up, man. I actually wrote a, a, a letter out today. I put a message out to my team. I said, listen, you know, how are we, what are we going to do when negativity rears its ugly head? Either number A, Number A, <laughs> either A, we, we uh, you know, we give up, we we give up on the opportunity, we give in to the negativity and, and shut down the opportunity. B, we shut down negativity and we give more to the opportunity. Or C, we just you know stay undecided, right? And then we always wonder what could have happened. So man, we got to make sure that we uh that we you know focus on some of these. These are just plain success principles. I don't care what industry, you know, I, you guys know I come from the music industry, right? I don't come from automotive, right? But I'm here now and I just use these principles over and over and over to succeed. And so that's what I'm appreciating you guys really sharing. So this is powerful stuff. So let me ask y'all this. What do you say? I mean, because I mean, you know, Brett, you could have been in any industry in the world. Uh, you know, Nate, you came into automotive because you wanted to make some money, which is great, right? Because <laughs> we know we can make money here. But what do you, let me start with Brett. What do you say? What do you absolutely love about the automotive industry from the time that you've been exposed to it over the last, would you say, a year, two and a half years, something like that? What would you say is something that you're like, man, I like this because it's different and why? I, so I absolutely love the go get them mentality, the mm. motivation, right? I mean, sales, uh, I feel like the sales, the automotive industry is is sales at its strongest, right? That you're going to find in almost any field you're going to go into. It's the hardest core, like, Go, 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 close, 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 close. And I love that mentality because it's almost like it breeds success. And I feel like everyone around you in this industry is just built around how do we thrive yet more so than almost any other industry I've been in. And I've been in a lot of different industries. And I feel like the automotive is just the more go getters in that single industry than than any others I think I've seen. So, yeah, no, I'm definitely with you on that. It's so crazy. I was watching Carl Icahn have a conversation about how he fired 12 floors worth of people at one point in time because he couldn't figure out what they did. They just were there, like not even bean counters, man, just pretending, like trying to create uh, a value that really wasn't there. So he's like, and what was crazy about it after he fired these 12 floors of people, nobody asked any questions. It wasn't like, oh, shoot, what am, I'm missing this, I'm missing that. It was like, it, it literally just disappeared right and you absolutely you don't you don't you don't find that in automotive man everybody in the automotive industry has a purpose we go for it right there's no you can't you you will get exposed real quick if you're a slacker in the automotive industry so <laughs> i'm definitely yep. with you on that one <laughs> nate, nate what would you say nate dog no, break it down to us tell us and I, what you I love you know especially once i got into a management position i loved taking somebody off the street and, and making them successful. And, uh, you know, I, I've got so many stories about a lot of tenant who, you know, we, we brought in, you know, a guy come in, wanted a sales job and we didn't have a, a spot for him at the moment. We're like, Hey, you know what, start off as a lot of tenant and work your way up. And, you know, I, I love those success stories and guys coming to me like that, that trusted the process. And, you know, they're like, Hey man, I made, I made 10 grand for the first time in my life in a, in a month. And, you know, I, I've got, yeah. A couple of different finance managers that I knew were going to be good. And I, and I, I told them, I said, I'll make you a deal. I'm going to put you in finance. You do what I say, when I say, how I say, don't, don't argue with me. Don't question the process. You follow my process and I will make you a hundred grand in your first year. And I would have a standing bet. I say, if you don't make a hundred grand and you do everything that I ask of you, I will make up the difference. But when you make, <laughs> but when you make a hundred grand, I want a bottle of Don Julio 1942. <laughs> hey, that's what and, I'm talking about. <laughs> every every single one of those times I made that bet, I got that bottle. You got that bottle. That's what I'm talking about. Hundred percent. Now, how many of those people are they using this? Uh, the e director. Tell us. Tell me about that. Oh yeah, they're uh, they're both. Uh, I, I did that three times at my last dealership in Montana, and uh, and that, that is uh, they use both of our programs. Yeah, they use our e director and our, our web based program called My Director. So yeah, they. They're they're a paying customer too. <laughs> wow. Now what's the other one? I didn't hear about that one. Tell me that one. Oh, so we got another program that it's called My Director. So basically, you know, back I was in I was still doing finance during COVID, and mm -hmm. our, our finance penetration went from 80% to 60%. And it wasn't because we had more customers who were paying cash. We just had more customers who were buying online. 
we were shipping cars out all across the country and they were doing outside financing. They weren't, we weren't getting a chance to do financing through the dealership because mm-hmm. our, our rates online weren't aggressive enough. You know, we were showing 3.9 rates as low as 3.9 and all this kind of stuff and mm-hmm. online. And the customer were like, well, why would I go through the dealership? At, if they're saying they're, they're going to get 3.9, I can go get 2.49 at my credit union. So, yeah. so we, we took the same technology, the patented technology that e-director has, and we, we, we have an app that, uh, or not an app, but a button basically that um, yeah. the dealership puts on their webpage that basically replaces their payment calculator. Mm-hmm. And what it does is it, it shows through transparency with the customer, hey, here's 10 of our biggest lenders that we use at our dealership. Based on your credit profile and the car you're buying, here's what the interest rate is going to be and here's what the payment is. No fluff, no hidden, no smoke, no mirrors, no, you know, no guy back in the box. And, and you know, so it, it's just super, uh, super aggressive, super transparent. And, and it's a way for online to uh, be, be a lot more aggressive and, and secure that financing for that for that well-educated customer who's wants to do with the whole process online. That's crazy, man. That's I'm just, so if, so if I'm a, you know, like you said, I was a lot attendant, right. I sold some cars. They just put me into finance. Right. And I'm like, man, I got to get access to this e-director thing. Or if I'm a dealer or if I'm, you know, responsible for the marketing, the website and I need, you know, to, cause that payment calculator you write is absolutely feels like it's ancient. Right. And so if I get that, who do I, do I call somebody? Do I read, how do I, how do I make this thing happen for me? Sure, man. You can, uh, anybody can reach out to me on Facebook. Uh, Nate Doggett, pretty easy to remember. If you can remember Nate Dog, you can remember Nate Doggett. Uh, two <laughs> G's and two T's. But yeah, hit me up on Facebook or our website uh, is edirectorllc.com. There's a, there's a spot on there where you can get a, uh, demos. You can see our program on there. Uh, and then there's a contact spot on there. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, just hit me up, man. And, and, and we'll, uh, if, if you mention this podcast, we will, we'll do a discount. We'll knock 200 bucks off our monthly rate. And, uh, if, hey. if you're a, you know, if you're a finance manager looking to get better, I, I'll work with you on that too. If it's something that you want to, you want to do just for yourself versus, you know, maybe the dealership isn't, isn't active and, and, and but you want to make yourself better. I'll work with you on that too. And, uh, and, and, and we'll make a program just for you. Wow, man. I totally appreciate that, man. Y'all hear that, man? Millionaire car salesman podcast listeners. He said, mention the podcast and you're going to get $200 knocked off. Listen, $200, you could do a lot. With How many drinks can they get with $200, Brett? I don't know. <laughs> uh, the kind of drinks that we usually drink, maybe like two, but still. But still so, uh, That's what I'm talking about. Get. Oh, man, this has been absolutely phenomenal. So just kind of like, as you know, we've been spending time here talking about because obviously these these uh, programs, e-director, my director are going to help people to make more money. Um, let's kind of cut, just give some closing statements on, you know, the importance of, you know, having financial wellness, because y'all know I, I have a background in, in music, but I also have a background in personal finance. I carry financial licenses and all kind of stuff like that. So just talk about that a little bit. Um, you can kind of just talk about an overall closing statement, but a, a reason why to just go ahead and, and get wealthy. What would y'all say? Let's start with Brett real quick. Uh, a reason to get wealthy. That's, a uh, you know, as I've gotten older, the biggest importance of that for me is it's not what I can do with the money. It's how many other people I could help with that money. Uh, one of them, obviously, would be my family, right? That's the most obvious. But mm-hmm. I'm one of those people that when I have money, I love to give it back. And uh, I, I kind of don't like to hang on to it too long. So the more money I have, the more money I can give away to friends and family. I say give away. I mean that, you know. I, I, <laughs> right. They're going to be hitting you up for all through, kind of through stuff. Numerous, through numerous, uh, yeah. Ways, but yeah, I got you. No, I totally understand where you come from, man. Giving is a super duper big part of even what we do here at Dealer Synergy, right? We got help because you can.com, right? You can't help because you can't if you don't handle that on money, right? Oh. So I feel you on that one. All right, Nate, what would you say, man? And I'd say it's all about a work life balance, right? I mean, if you're if, if you're struggling and you're just not making the money and you got to work two or three jobs, you know, it, it's hard to it's hard to enjoy any extra time you've got when you don't have money to spend it. Um, I mean, I like to I like to work hard. Don't get me wrong, but I also like to play hard. And and, and uh, you know, if, if, if you if you are, are dedicated and you focus and you, and you find your niche, um, you know, I was reading I was reading a story the other day that everybody's a genius at something. And, and you just got to find out what that, what you're a genius at. Actually, I think it was from the internet, uh, the internet sales group. 
Yeah, uh, Mr. Mike Zeller. He, yeah. He's got a book called uh, The Genius Within. Yeah. So, you know, just really focusing on that, right? And figuring out, I mean, I never thought I was going to be a finance guy. I, I, I don't even know how to do math, bro. Um, but you know what? I found my niche, and I, and I feel like it's been very it's been very successful. And and I, I like to work hard, but I also like to play hard. I like to do a. I'm big into fly fishing, and you know, it's, and it's an expensive game. And I can yeah. tell you, I, I've I've never had a bad day on the water. And I, even if I don't catch a fish, I've still got a smile on my face at the end of the day. And and if you don't if you don't have the money to do that and to be able to take that time off, you you just you just don't enjoy life. You hear about you hear too many stories about people who die at 50 or 60 years old, you know, and, and never have a chance to, to enjoy, enjoy the time that they have on this, on this world. And, and, and I guess that's my thing, man, just find that work-life balance, work hard. Don't get me wrong. But if you're in a spot where they're making you work, you know, you're working 12 hours a day, six days a week, really? Come on. I mean, are you, are you going to be the best version of you if you're doing that? Hmm. Absolutely not. <laughs> I love that. I love the, everything that you just shared, man. That's powerful. And then you mentioned the whole fly fishing, man. I'm telling. Listen, I don't. We go. I don't have. To, I don't know. Can you think of blind guy? You think I could do fly fishing? I wonder how that would work. Right? Uh, we <laughs> can make it work. You come see me in LA. We'll make it work, buddy. I can get you on fish. That's I, what I'm talking serious. about. You got a good like, diet, man. It, you know, it, it's a. It's a magical thing, man. It's a, it's all about a it's all about a rhythm. It, it, I'm not going to say it would be easy, but I think it'd be a challenge, and I'm I'm always up for a challenge. So anytime it's you want to go, you know, that's what I'm talking about. We're gonna make some stuff happen, man. Wait wait till y'all see the videos on Facebook and everything. <laughs> it's gonna be a part. So, man, listen, this is what we do here at the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast. We're always focused on, hey, what can we do? How can we help get some more money in your pockets? And listen, I know folks are focused on getting promoted, uh, spe specifically today into you know finance management. We talk about every aspect, but as a general manager, right, you want to make it easier for your finance folks to make some more money, right? As a dealer, you want to make sure that you're your website is in place to help your dealership make some more money, right? So that we can do some of the things that we just talked about. So we could fly fish and we could give to others and all kind of stuff like that, right? All of that stuff is important. And so listen, I always say, listen, you are the average of the five people who you spend the most time with. And you've just been spending time with Mr. Brett Davis, with Mr. Nate Doggett, and the one and only L.A. Williams, the blind master. So listen, it's your turn. Go out there and be a millionaire car salesman. We'll talk to y'all later. Peace. So there you have it, the Millionaire Car Salesman podcast. This podcast comes to you every week from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If you have a question about the show or would like the chance to become a guest, feel free to contact us directly at 856 546 2440 or email us at millionairecarsalesman at gmail.com. This program is a presentation of Synergy Records, produced by Tiana Mick and L.A. Williams. Production and engineering by L.A. Williams. The Millionaire Car Salesman podcast is hosted every week by L.A. Williams and the millionaire car salesman himself, Sean V. Bradley. The Millionaire Car Salesman podcast can be found everywhere, so please don't forget to review, subscribe to, and share the show. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire Car Salesman podcast, and remember, where I'm from, money provides options. The Millionaire Car Salesman podcast is sponsored in part by AutoWeb. If you enjoyed this podcast, then make sure to give it a thumbs up subscribe and leave us a review you know let some other folks know about it oh and don't forget to join the millionaire car salesman group on facebook we'll see you there <laughs>